Talk Show. It's the Daily Talk Show, episode 550. And we've got John Safran in the building. I also thought I was here for a personal training. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny you should say that. I was John's personal trainer for many years. I, um, I just looked because it coincided around the time of your birthday, uh, marking a, a, a good year. Mm. That was seven years ago that yep. I was training you far out. Oh, God, yeah, it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> what, me training you or just the no, time? No, no, it's okay. No, you you were a good trainer. Was I? Yeah. I mean, we have you I didn't, haven't. You didn't, like, stare at your phone. All the trainers now just, like, do that on their phone the well, whole time. Well, this would have been, like, so sort true. of a pre-smartphone in a, yeah. in a big way. It was, yeah, he occasionally played Snake on his Nokia <laughs> <laughs> whilst I was doing push-ups. But besides that. It was, um, so you came into the gym where I was working and somehow you got assigned to me. Oh, yeah. And I was, it was, it felt serendipitous at the time because I was wanting to get into television and I had no idea what, what you'd been up to. Oh, yeah, I'm having your- flashbacks now. Yeah. Where you thought. I had all this guidance and advice and I didn't. <laughs> and then you thought I was like holding back on you when really I just didn't have any guidance or advice. You are the OG vlogger though. Oh yeah, I guess so. We, we, it wasn't even called vlog. It was, what was it? Um, uh, video blog. Like you, what did you, video diary. This was when you did race around the world. Oh yeah, that's true. Yes. It, it was the first cameras that had come out where they had the flip screen. Mm-hmm. So there was like, we were like video diarying ourselves for this ABC show and it just seemed confusing and new and revolutionary and stuff. There's about two megapixel cameras back then. It's, um, it's interesting. Like I've always been surprised at how they, television, when I say they, the networks are, you know, we want high quality, but then they allow like integration of things like GoPros into feature films. Mm-hmm. Was it a consideration of the, the poor quality back then? Oh, yeah. I, I remember like not only this show Race Around the World, which had that, but even shows like Cops where like the cameras were on the – you know, the front of the police cars and that, that just seemed like really, it really threw you a bit yeah. as a viewer because you just hadn't seen that because TV shows up until that were like really well lit and mm. it was a requirement and, you know, the cameras on tripods and and then uh, then for some reason, like the most commercial uh, like networks and commercial shows took the genre of like documentary, mm. which up until then was considered really like, are like pretentious and arty and highbrow or whatever. And then, but the, then they suddenly took all those techniques mm. and suddenly, like, so keeping up with the Kardashians and all the, and the Osbournes or whatever, and all these like really, they could not be more mainstream shows were like, you know, taking all the techniques of, you know, uh, you know, documentary filmmaking where like you don't have to put things on tripods and you can swing the camera and it goes out of focus for a couple of seconds and, yeah, it doesn't matter if it kind of it's in bad lighting or whatever. So yeah, thanks a lot, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> what do you think? Stealing, you know, the you know the things that I helped set up. What do you think of mainstream? Mainstream as what? a concept. I feel like you're quite the the fringe. Guy. Oh no, I'm. That's only if I'm uh, like countercultural. That's just because I'm unsuccessful <laughs> at being more popular. I can't. T- whenever I start a new project, I am like, for instance, I'm working on a new book for Penguin. It's my third book. And when I have, I'm having meetings with Penguin, it's not like, oh, how do we make this really like art house and inaccessible? We all like are thinking like, we're like, oh my God, like how, how are we going to make this one, the one that breaks out at Big W and everything? And yeah. So you love Big W. Yeah, I love, oh, I, I, I literally have conversations with Penguin where I say, how can we frame this so this book will be one of those ones that gets, you know, put up at Big, big W. Yeah. You want to be like Barefoot Investor. <laughs> oh, it, literally, yes. <laughs> but, uh, but, it, but you know, I'm, d- I'm just not that. I'd do that. I'd sell out if I thought I was, I'd be any good at it. But what the problem with selling out is it doesn't work mm. and then you're not happy with the work you've done. Mm. Whilst if you do, if I do something like where I'm kind of following my instinct a bit more and I'm uh, – then it can work and mm. it's great. If it doesn't work, you still kind of got this thing you like. So what would you what never would, what would selling out look like for you? And have uh, you had a, a moment where you've had the opportunity to sell out? No, I have. I, I can't tell you how people just smell. There's something about my shtick that, like, viewers just don't buy me being disingenuous. Like, like to my to myself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So. I, like I've even done like subtle things, for instance, where I, it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to do a story where it's about, uh, you know, Star Trek and science fiction fans or whatever. 
And just the audience didn't even pick up that I'm not really, like mm. that's not really my scene or whatever. And they're not, it's not like they throw bricks at me or whatever, mm. but it, like it just sort of doesn't work. Like I always have to be following these things that I'm obsessed with or else, yeah, the readers just, and or listeners or viewers just kind of don't buy it. Well, I think it works. Mm. Oh, no, thank you. You've, you've done a lot of television, three books. Is, yes. Is, it's pretty good. Um, we've, we've been talking about authenticity and you could say that if you feel cringe about something and you listen to that feeling <laughs> yeah. that that's being authentic. Whereas I feel that sometimes you can feel not great about putting something out into the world because you just, uh, it's not the best or I don't think, but then you do put it out and it works. How do you actually identify what's authentic for you? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I guess I, 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 there's like a triangle. Hey, this is a bit like a Ted talk where if great. I'm about to do something, it has to be, uh, it's, it's, it's like a tension between what I reckon an audience wants and then what I want and then also what the person who's green lighting it wants and you just have to negotiate around that, I guess. Did that answer your question? Can we Jesus get animated Christ. at least? Oh, yeah. That was amazing. <laughs> and that TED Talks are 18 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the lamest TED Talk. And uh, TEDx. <laughs> I do. I, I, I tell you where, where I, I do like look for outside things and, and like try to study them. It's not so much topics or subject matters, it's structure. I'm really bad at structure. So when I'm like writing, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> so what's really cool, my first book was a true crime book. And what's really Murder cool- in Mississippi. Yes. And what's really cool about writing about true crime <clears> is <throat> there's things to do where you like, you don't have to really think about structure because the structure works out itself because you're investigating a crime and then you go, okay, well, I go to the police station where they investigated the crime. Then I'll go to the street where the guy was killed and knock on doors. And you, you've got the, like this to-do list of things to do. And, and I, But I find if I don't have that to-do list, I'm just really um, confused. Mm. Talking about crime, podcasting mm. uh, within sort of the crime space, that seems to be the one that's that has been popping, yes. how does it feel to have something that you, back on the mainstream thing, all of a sudden becomes cool? Yeah, I, I think it's not fair that <laughs> I think that I should be like, yeah, more mainstream considering, yeah, I, I was I, I, like before Serial or whatever, I was, I was like, oh, doing that true crime thing before it kind of popped and then somehow... Yeah, why is Serial? Why are they? So is it the medium, right? Because yeah. I, I have, like, I, I read Murder in Mississippi and when I was training you, you were doing the book. So you were telling me stuff that was going on and then I was connecting it with the book. So I have this, like, really vivid picture of what you, the journey you went on with that. And it's just as vivid as the Serial one. So it's like, it's the medium at that point. It's a um, podcast. Oh, versus a book. Yeah, Versus that's true. the book. Yeah. No, that, that, that's true. And but now, now audio books are becoming really bigger. They're really growing. So uh, now, now they're releasing audio books on the same date as the paper book and there's like no distinction between them. So maybe my, my next book will be the... Mm. I mean, a, good, a contentious, contentious issue is when Josh says he's read a book mm -hmm. and I say, did you listen or did you read? Yeah, I listened. I've got a hundred and... 70 audio books, <laughs> uh, weird flex again. Can you say um, you've read a book when you've listened to it, John? Yeah, I, re I reckon yeah, so. Yeah, okay. All right, I'm wrong. But I, I, yeah, I, I mean, this seller just did his <laughs> original with Audible. So that's just <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, no, yeah, that is true. Yeah, my, my last project was with Audible, so there's a bit of a gun against my head to and go so along with that. What's, it, yeah. what's that like? What is it like um, uh, <clears throat> taking on a project? You were talking about the audience, I guess what the publisher yeah. wants. What is Audible like as a as a stakeholder? Oh no, it's it's really good, and they're part of making sure books don't die, and they're part of uh, you know getting good content out there. And they're trying to have an angle, so they 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 sort of put a lot of thought into things. Like they're not just throwing out endless content. That they're trying to have a point of distinction between the endless content. So. Yeah, that they really put a lot of uh, thought into my project. What does it mean when, if you are someone that doesn't like structure or do well with structure? How does that work when a company gives you a bunch of cash and says, go on, make this thing? Uh, I often, so it's a combo of things. Sometimes I will, like when I'm writing, I, I, I'll read a lot of other books in the genre I'm writing and try to figure out the blueprint. 
And so I did that with like true crime where before I went off, I was just freaking out because I'd never written a book before and I'd never really written a lengthy piece before. And I kind of didn't really hand in all my university essays either. (laughs) And then suddenly I'd sign this thing where I have to like deliver a book. You know, books are quite thick. Yeah. Like once they're on your your, the, your phone, you can forget how thick they are. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was freaking out and I just read true crime book after true crime book and was kind of trying to like analyse the blueprint. And then when I went over to Mississippi, I sort of was going, okay, that's happened in that book. So how do I do this but with my thing? Are you whatever. a quick reader? No. Nah. I mean, I, I can be, I can be, but and not generally. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I always find when I'm reading, if I try and get too fast... I re- realise I'm actually not reading. Like there's actually no, like I'm not retaining any information. Do yeah. you have any tips when it comes to researching if you've got to consume a bunch of books? Uh, yeah, I, I, I always read. I'm really driven by shame and guilt. So I find if I read two books at the same time, when I'm reading that one, I'm feeling guilty about not reading the other one. So I go, okay, and I'll go to the other one. And then, oh, okay, I'll go to the other And that kind of keeps it going. So, yeah, just... Yeah, people have like real w- weird relationships with books mm-hmm. these days. Like they, they, where it's like with shame. Like you're, oh, is it, if I listen to it, is it a book? Mm-hmm. And and all that that jazz. But I, I also think that if you don't, don't like a book, like to stop reading it mm-hmm. because it, it might be the author's fault. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of things yeah. where it's meant to be. Like people go, oh, I didn't finish reading that book, and I feel so bad or whatever. And like it says something bad about me as a person. Mm-hmm. But maybe like the, it wasn't a good book. Maybe it was good that you stopped reading it. I feel like you're very honest. Do you think it's a poser move? Sometimes I'll listen to an audio book <laughs> yes. and I enjoy it and then so I buy the physical copy of the book to put on my bookshelf. Am I a poser? <laughs> I don't know if you're a poser, but I, I've occasionally gone through stages with a Kindle mm-hmm. where I, I'm, and I'm reading a book and it, it, makes, it has such an important effect on me. Like I think I read like in cold blood on Kindle or whatever and then – yeah, I am feeling afterwards going, oh, I wish I had the had the book. And I have occasion. yeah, I have bought, like I think I bought it in cold blood after the fact. Okay. But didn't read the physical copy? Oh, no, I think I ended up reading it again or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I, yeah, I can relate to that. It is, it is nice having the. Yeah. Well, w- one uh, thing that I've started to do because I feel I got self-conscious about people potentially saying, hey, it doesn't look like you've read the book, as in because it, the physically the yeah. book is, isn't worn. But there's a, a website called World of Books that sells secondhand books. Oh, yeah. And so you can just go on there. And so I can get a book <laughs> that's actually been read by heaps of people. Oh, that's oh, the yeah. one where you got a quirky note in it. Oh, so, yeah, there's, I found, like, notes from people, like birthday messages. Oh, they yeah. had one which was Judd Apatow's book. Um, what's that called? Judd, uh, Judd Apatow's book? I can't remember the title. But um, he... Sick in the head is what it was called. Uh, I got like the publisher, co- like a, a pre-release mm. copy, not for sale. Yeah, it not, says it said not for sale. Oh yeah, <laughs> uncorrected yeah. proof. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're they're great. That's mm. a real for a poser. poser. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, when I was at Triple J, we got sent lots of books, and yes, I've got quite a few mm. of these uncorrected proofs. Yeah. And that's like, um, yeah, that that's maximum poser. <laughs> I can send some of them to you if, you're, sale. if, if you want to go out posing with yeah. like some uncorrected proof. <laughs> How are you a poser? How am I? A po- oh. What do you do? I don't know. Am I accused of? It's hard to know because I guess you kind of do subconscious things or whatever. Uh, have I? I, don't I feel like you think enough. That I think we're all posers. Yes. And so you just like what is the on? What do you do purely to be on brand? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Luckily, my brand is just uh, being not uh, being a poser, which makes it hard to answer <laughs> this question. Or just being, <laughs> uh, being a bit of a, a unhinged, unkilted. If mm. That's a word. Unkilted? Is that even a word? Or is that, 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 not wear, is that not, just not wearing a kilt? <laughs> <Kilted. They're, laughs> so things fit into my personal work. Like I play Scrabble a lot, but it's not. Oh, I'm yeah. not being a poser. You've it's been doing like, that for years. Yeah, it's just yeah. I do it. So, yeah, so lots of, <clears> I guess, I don't know. Well, I'm going whitewater rafting, which I haven't done. Uh, oh, I've only done one day of it before, but I'm going on an eight-day whitewater rafting thing later this week in Tasmania. So that's a bit, that could be so posing. So why do you want, like, what's the bit in you that wants to do that? I like boot camp because ever mm. since he dumped me, like my, <laughs> uh, you know, my exercise has gone down. So I just thought going into 2020, it'd be cool, like the last, you have an eight-day boot camp basically. Yeah. You're like, it's like six hours a day um, paddling. But, I mean, there's a few things. You're doing that 
without mates. You're doing mm-hmm. it with a group of people you don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of co- – that's confronting for most people to, yeah. to do something like that on your own. I mean, you know, you know um, you've, do, you've, you've done a lot of things where you've put yourself in uh, uncomfortable situations. Do you, think, do you think people think you fly under the radar – or when you go and enter the alt right uh, p- p- um, protest, yeah. are you actually fitting in, or are they going, ah, it's John again? Oh, yeah. Usually someone squeals, <laughs> so, but it's it's kind of like, like the last thing I've done like that, which they're totally not like the alt right at all. But like where I went into a world that you know I hadn't really gone into uh, was just last week, where I was in New Zealand for the vape expo. And so I was hanging out with the the world vape scene. So <laughs> vaping um, is it illegal in Australia to buy the liquid, or only the, it's illegal to buy from Australia nicotine liquid, but you can order nicotine liquid from overseas. And so you're you're sort of going. This is can I say one of the things you, that has grabbed your attention? You said yes. you go after things that just you know squeeze that attention inside you or the interest. Um, where, how deep is the rabbit hole of vaping? Like the vape convention? What the f- what's, what's that? <laughs> oh, the va- well, vape ex- well, in this case it was mainly vape juice suppliers and vape stores and, and like Chinese companies that manufacture vapes all getting together and working out deals and stuff like mm. that. But there was also – I was interested in it because I think compared to last year, it's only the second year and already like big cigarette companies – uh, siding into it. Uh, so if you went last year, it was it was a lot more of a kind of a cowboy thing, for want of a better word, where it's like all these companies you haven't heard of and mm. um, you know grassroots type things. And already in like one year, uh, the like big cigarette companies have realised, oh, this is we've we've got to get involved in this scene. So, mm. yeah. There's money there. Mm. Yes. Have you ever smoked a cigarette before? Yeah, just not. I haven't while smoked. training. When he was training, he used to. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 but never, never really. Not, like not for a sustained period. Mm. But like, I, I guess like anyone who's past the age of thirty, probably or whatever, let alone forty, is yeah, just like over the years, you've whatever. Like, Why do people smoke? Is that the ultimate poser move? Smoking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, actually, one interesting thing about vaping is that because it's brand new, there hasn't been settled even on exactly what the stereotypes are mm. of vapors. So when I'd like message people like friends, I go, Oh, I'm off in New Zealand doing a vaping thing. They'll get back to me and they're all like different stereotypes, mm. like oh, hanging out with those hipsters who are vaping or hang out. But then someone else will be, Oh, hang out with those bogans vaping. And then someone else <laughs> hang out with those neck beards vaping. <laughs> so I feel uh, like they all have in common crypto. I feel like they all have some <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah, well, I'll add that to my book. Of uh, I, I had this idea for my book of how seeing there's no stereot not there's no stereotypes, mm. but it's multifaceted. Yeah, yeah it hasn't it? quite settled, and I don't yeah. quite know what the stereotype is. Like compared with things like if you're talking about dope or something, you'd be going, mm. oh, the you know uh, Bob Marley fans and all that mm. stuff but like now, that. But now, like, in, we were just in California and they're all pushing back on that sort of thing now. They're trying to, you know, create the the Apple store for marijuana and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's what the at least one cigarette company is trying to do with e-cigarettes is, yeah, the, the way they package their e-cigarette is like the Apple iPhone and their stores in America that they're starting to roll out. I think they've only got two at the moment, but they're, they're both like peop- they look like the Apple iStores and they're, I guess it, part of what they're trying to do is make you not think about the nicotine and tobacco element of it and just, I don't know, think you're putting an iPhone in your mouth, which you would like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if you could smoke that phone, Josh would be doing it. And so when did you, when was the first time you ever smoked a cigarette? Uh, I think, I th- well, yeah, I think when I was in Cubs or something, mm-hmm. we were out on a, a hike. And the reason I remember it was because... Uh, who smoked it. And I kind of got confused. I took incomplete information because I remember like from the films and whatever and comic books, it's like you got you tap it, like, you know, like you tap it on the table or mm-hmm. whatever to get rid mm-hmm. of the ash. But I sort of, I tapped it on my bare leg <laughs> in my shorts because I just, uh, yeah. Panicked. I, yeah, panicked or I was just didn't want to, I just was trying to like look casual or whatever. So it was like, and then I was like, oh, mm-hmm. and then I like, I really held it in. 
So that's why I, re- I remember that as my first cigarette. Were, I, were you good at Cubs? At what? We, at Cubs. You said you were doing Cubs, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, the weird thing about – I have no idea why these are – The headphones, there you they're, go. They're yeah, running yeah. away from me. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're so bored by my anecdotes. <laughs> 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 trying to escape. Um, yeah, yeah, so I went to Cubs, Scouts, and Venturers, but – and I turned up, I had nothing against it, but, but I don't kind of remember it. It wasn't really my scene, even mm. at, like my parents sent me mm. there and, and you're so young, you don't even know what your scene is. Uh, but, I, but I was like caving and hiking and doing all this stuff and smoking cigarettes. But then, the, but the thing I mainly remember, which had the biggest impact, were these two older kids and they had memorized, they were obsessive Monty Python fans. And so we'd go on these hikes and I didn't know who Monty Python was go on these hikes and they'd be doing all the songs from Monty Python but kind of speeding it up a bit and then doing excerpts from all the skits or whatever. And I remember like just walking behind them and I almost like, like using them as my Walkman. <laughs> and and th- then later on when I was a bit older, yeah, I, I bought the tapes myself and I listened and I preferred their cover versions because, they, yeah, they had really <laughs> sped up things and kind of cut to the chase in a lot of things. And But, yeah, but so the fact that that is what I mainly remember about my many years cub scouting and venturing when I was sailing and caving and abseiling, but I'd, somehow that didn't make an impact on me. But, yeah, the two older guys doing the Monty Python songs, that's what I remember. Probably yeah, that, that showed how, my, yeah, my scene was more there. <laughs> what is your scene? What did it change to younger days before you got into telly? Well, uh, I think from about grade three I just had – some vibe that I wanted to do something creative. So I'd do I'd like write parody songs and things and try to write comic strips. I was, I'm really bad at drawing. So I just tried out a lot of things and, I, and like, like in primary school, I'd, I'd write skits for mm. shows and everything. So yeah, I was a bit of a mogul even back then. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you look at now people sort of in the industry that you're in, especially telly or creating visual content, they usually enter via being a filmmaker. So they're, to on the tools trying to film whether it's themselves or things do you classify yourself as a filmmaker was that something early days you th- you thought that you were or nah I, I i don't even know quite what i was wanting to do but so i was just trying out these different things and i i don't and like i tried being in bands and stuff it's like really awkward and it's embarrassing <laughs> to say like i sincerely was there um Rapping in a band, like I'm, I'm pretty awkward. <laughs> well, uh, music jamboree, you were yes. I mean, you've brought those elements into a lot of the stuff that you've done. Yeah, but I yeah. So so I just fe- fell into the documentary thing through Race Around the World because there was a an ad on the ABC saying, "Oh, have you n- never been on TV and want to be a filmmaker or something like that?" And so I just responded to that to the opportunity. But I'd never bef- before that thought, "Oh, I want to be in documentary," like. I'm sure I'd seen some documentaries, but I hadn't really thought that hard about it. Did you think you were a good storyteller? Uh, You're singing now. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a good singer. <laughs> I guess. I, I don't know. I, I, I knew I wanted to, but I don't think I was there, mm. like, resting on my laurels or being vain about it. I think I was more hungry. I was hungry to be yeah. a storyteller rather than I thought I was a good storyteller. I think there's an intuitive nature to stories. Everyone, we... we we learn them as kids. We grow up sharing information through story. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, maybe you weren't thinking you were great, but it, it, there is a level of intuitiveness to storytelling that I think you can't re- – how do you teach that? Mm-hmm. I, 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 knew, I sort of <clears throat> knew I, I picked up by instinct what things I thought people would think was interesting and also things that other people couldn't tell them. So – Straight away, I realised, even though when I went, to, I went to this Hasidic Jewish school with side locks and everything, and straight away when I started having to produce work for Race Around the World, I realised, oh, like I had access to this like little secret world that most people don't know about and it's, everyone's kind of interested in peeking behind the curtains mm. of things that are secret, whether it's like a... The Freemasons, or a Hasidic school, or a cigarette company, or mm. a nightclub, or something. Everyone's like fascinated by getting to peek behind the curtain of something that they usually can't see. So yeah, I guess I picked up that. I had a bit of instinct of like I, I of what I thought people found interesting about my experiences, and then 
left alone all the things that I didn't think they would find interesting. Mm. Do you think you were, you were a weird kid? <laughs> no, I had it too easy as a kid. I wasn't beaten up enough. <laughs> so when I, I went to this primary school, to this state primary school, and I was pretty true to myself. I don't, and I didn't think about it that hard. Mm. And I never felt like anyone bullying me or saying you can't be like that. And yeah, so probably I'd have different stories if I was picked on more as a kid. Yeah. And maybe I needed to be picked on more <laughs> as a kid in retrospect. But now at the moment I'm, I'm f- and in the last couple of years, I've ended up in writer's rooms, like uh, writing, helping people with their shows that are like, uh, like thrillers and things like that. And I, I wrote a, our episode of this Australian uh, thriller, I guess, that it, it didn't end up being produced or whatever. But anyway, through I, I always find that like really fun. And so I can absolutely imagine a p- parallel universe where instead of getting into documentary, I just ended up being like a script writer and I'd be pretty happy. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure how much I'm motivated. I know it sounds like I'm denying it or trying to have it both ways, but I'm not sure how much... Like I'm really that in love with like, oh, I have to be the face of things or I have to be, I, I think it's sort of like ended up that way. And then. Was it easier to put yourself sort of behind the camera to tell the story? Yeah. I, well, even well, like these days, it's also that people who are like the green light my work are not that interested not in not me being in it. Mm-hmm. So if, if I was to say to Penguin, Oh, I want to write a book, but it's a fiction and all, all this stuff like that and it's not going to have my voice or something like that. Like I just don't think they want it. Mm. When so, you're in a writer's room, yes, can you uh, distinguish between your voice and the voice that they need? Uh, well, the cool thing about writer's room is often there's several people there and you get to pick up on everyone's little obsessions and how that kind of contributes to the – the main project. I, I, I just give my contribution and then they can, they don't have to take it. They can, you know, it's not my project, it's theirs. So, but yeah, generally the thing I can bring to the table is conflict. Mm-hmm. Not, not a fight in the room, but where, uh, and I'm just basing this on all the TV, like before I did my first writer's room, because the show was kind of sort of in the ballpark of kind of, of things like, Breaking Bad, I guess. I mean, not really, but whatever. I just like binge watched yeah. all these shows and tried to pick up the patterns. And I go, to go, oh my god, it's all about everything. Just has to be a fight all the time. <laughs> and so, yeah, generally, when I'm in writers' rooms. I just make all the characters fight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so coming from like writing, you know, John Safran's Race Relations, where it's your baby, yeah, and you've sort of led the direction of it from start to finish to doing something where you're collaborating with others. What, what have you learnt there about collaboration and how the hierarchy works or who's leading or that kind of? Oh, generally with collaborations I've found <coughs> that, that I, I, maybe I've just been fortunate but it, it's, it's not been like, oh, oh well, I, I want the other person destroyed or like <laughs> you're, you're kind of pushing in the same direction and, and so if you, if you trust the other people when they say, oh, like that's a lame idea, you kind of go, oh, okay, well, I, I guess I can trust them. They're not like out to get me. It probably is a lame idea. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's usually not that melodramatic. You, I do have – and sometimes you do have fights where you – not fights but disagreements where you cave and then afterwards you realise they were right. And so that makes it confusing. On, on my occult – a podcast I just did with Audible. Yeah, there were a couple of things where, uh, you know, I was pushing back and forth about whether this should be in or that this should not be in. And eventually I was just like, oh, okay, fine, put it in. And then, you know, I've got good feedback about it. So, it's, yeah, so it's, it's really difficult yeah. to know. Well, I mean, what makes up a good idea? How do you know if something's going to be a good idea? Uh, I guess just, in, yeah, like instinct and also like if things – and making me laugh, or or if 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 things are just if I'm just curious about something, uh, generally that's a really good starting point. Mm. What have you been curious about today specifically? Uh, today, mm. uh, I know. So so because I'm in the the 
the uh, I'm, I'm in the world of smoking at the moment. So, <laughs> but not smoking. But not smoking. Yeah. So that that was a bit unfortunate because the book would have a far more obvious drive if it was like I'm addicted to cigarettes and <laughs> and so that's why I'm looking into this topic. But it, it's it's amazing that once you start uh, looking into a topic, just every every all the stories come out, all your friends mm. come out, and and yeah, is it? Do you start obsessing, or is it just yeah. focused thought? No, no, it's obsessing. <laughs> Have you thought about <laughs> taking up smoking for the book? I did. I, I absolutely mm. would if I thought it would ring true. So a, a lot of a lot of times when I'm like throwing myself into books because that's what the mm-hmm. an audience wants, and also the publisher they want me to be like part of the story. And then I have to really think about whether an audience is going to take it as sincere or not. So that's that's the problem with me trying to get addicted to cigarettes <laughs> whilst I did get briefly addicted to uh, nicotine toothpicks at the Vape Expo <laughs> in New Zealand. It's this new thing where, yeah, it's just their uh, toothpicks doused in a nic- nicotine and mm. so you go like that and then you can start chewing on them a bit and then I like chewed ten in a row and then I was like all jittery and like, um, yeah, I was kind of like fumbling about, buzzing about the expo and it was good. Um, and I, I, was, I was madly like recording all of it. <laughs> having it like, well, it, does, rem- it gives you like a, it's like a caffeine hit kind mm. of. Yeah. I, I remember what I was babbling. I was talking about because on a previous TV show I'd done, I'd taken peyote, that oh yeah, that, uh, that uh, hallucinogenic that uh, uh, some Native American uh, take. And and you have these hallucinant dreams. And and I was anyway, so I was walking around the Vapex bow last week after jittery on these nicotine toothpicks, just going, Oh my god, this is such a crap sequel. What a sort of like what a disappointing sequel. Like, you know, <laughs> no, I took peyote in Arizona and but now I'm just jittering around on nicotine toothpicks at a vape expo. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so uh, hopefully they'll, they'll probably make it to the book, I guess. The um is <laughs> nicotine actually bad for you so you go know, smoking yeah the smoke on your lungs the mm. added shit but then the nicotine itself what so do you know I, about I, that so i think the simple answer the, like the unnuanced answer is the thing with nicotine is that it's addictive but it's not actually it's it's not what is dangerous what's dangerous is inhaling like carcinogens um in different forms having said that one asterisk and keep in mind i'm a humanities student who mm-hmm. wasn't paying attention in science <laughs> so definitely do due diligence <laughs> on anything i say i think there are now some scientists who are saying no there there is a harm to nicotine beyond it just being addictive so but what is nicotine it's an in, oh my god i can't believe i know the answer to this yeah it's a, it's an extract <laughs> from uh, tobacco leaf, but it's not really when, when you, yeah, it, yeah it's, an, it, it's an extract from tobacco. Yes, but it's not, it's not, this is where it gets confusing because the thing that like, gives you cancer in cigarettes isn't the nicotine that's an extract from tobacco. It's the tobacco leaf in it that when it's, uh, when you inhale the carcinogens of the smoke. And this is where it gets really uh, like you can tell I'm really hemming and whoring and trying to <laughs> think because, because – If you um, had nicotine, you'd be up and about. Because the whole thing with vaping, like the controversy is about whether inhaling things in a vaping form is as dangerous as inhaling smoke. And then – and when it comes to vapes, there's not even – there's like different forms of vapes. There's this thing called vape – there's this vapes as we understand it. And then there's these new things called heat, not burn tobacco, where you're inhaling a vapour. Of tobacco, and then the people who produce that argue that that's safer. But it's not. <laughs> and no. so, what do you want to get out of like on a a book project yes. like this? What what's success look like? What do you actually want to end up with? I have to go on a mad rollicking adventure, and I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit. I'm a bit. I'm a bit thingy about like showing my hand with this with this book yet because I'm still sort of trying to get into places, but, but generally it's, a, it's about big companies leaning into the vape scene, this scene that sort of grew up a bit organically and sort of what the consequences of that are going to be. But I promise you it's going to be like funny and an adventure. So is there a point adventure. of view? Do you go in with, hey, I've got a point of view, you know, like you watch a Michael Moore yeah. 
doco and you know that it's sort of like edited and it's sort of building a case, are you going to set that up as like, hey, this is my case and then I go explore it? I think, yeah, I think so. People don't, people are really don't put up with me being moralizing a lot, mm-hmm. so which is kind of annoying. What does would, that mean? Um, like, like, <coughs> like, like if I did a, like, God damn it, people don't like Nazis, but I promise you, <laughs> if I put out, out a book where I'm like, you know what? Screw Nazis. And I'm like, oh, Saffron's whining again. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, even, so people just don't put up with me moralizing a lot. So, so I always, I, I guess I try to just get obsessed with something. Mm. And then, yeah, like, like, yeah, I, I like I like exploring all the contradictions and all the ambiguities and all the reasons why things don't fit together neatly. So, like in my last book, were about extremism. Like, I, I kept on doing things where I'd find these right wing extremists who weren't white, and so then it would like it's just like awkward to read because it's like you know if you're reading about extremists, it's like oh it's it's a real it's really easy and comfortable to read if you're talking about like the classic neo-Nazis versus a minority, but then it's like, oh, just say there's like evangelical Christians in Australia from a minority group, you know, like Sri Lankan group, and they don't like Muslims mm-hmm. and they're out protesting Muslims. It's like suddenly it's it's all a bit awkward. And, yes, yeah, so I, I like um, poking into that. And I don't know if audiences like that as much anymore. When I was young, everyone, <laughs> like people on the left, they loved all that stuff where you like, bring up all the contradictions and about how things don't mm. rest easily. Like I remember when I was on Triple J, we'd have this informal, irregular segment, which was called Clash of Political Correctness, where there's like an issue and it's just awkward because uh, like the one I think about is in, in America, the, that, you know, the Cherokee tribe, mm. uh, Cher- uh, Native Americans, they decided that within their tribe there were uh, black Americans who were the descendants of slaves that had been owned by the Cherokee Indians. So, which already sounds weird that the Cherokee Indians had black slaves, but they did. Anyway, and anyway, that, they, they decided that they were going to kick the, uh, these black Americans out of their tribe because of all these benefits you get if you're a Cherokee, like, uh, you know. Um, and so then it became like this weird, awkward thing of, hang on, do you believe in indigenous self-determination in which case you're a racist against black people because they're kicking them out of the tribe or do you believe that black people should remain in a tribe in which case you're you don't believe in self-determination because you're telling the Cherokee Indians what they can and can't do isn't this just all media now isn't this what every story <laughs> oh yeah maybe it be? is maybe maybe it is but yet yeah, like but I think I think amongst sort of my little in a very broad sense the kind of people would be in- interested in my perspective like people like things to be clear-cut and neat now mm. and explainable in a tweet and then if you're a bit of a, I guess I guess I'm a bit of a troll like wh- why like that that, <laughs> that, that that thing where I t- was talking about uh the Cherokee Indians kicking the black Americans out of their tribe like I'm you know it's uh, it's really interesting and worth talking about but uh, yeah there is an element where it's like I'm saying it because you know, you ha- it kind of has to open your brain up and you're being stimulated a bit or something. But, yeah, I'm not sure people like that anymore. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of veganism? Veganism? Mm, it seems like the shit hot thing everyone's talking about. It. It's either okay. uh, you're pro or veganism I- or eat lots of meat. Ah, and there's okay. the documentary Game Changers on Netflix. <laughs> which oh, I- or, or it's the connection to climate change. Mm-hmm. So the, yeah, definitely. The, yeah. Uh, I, I reckon th- there's some issues where I, I, I think about if I had a girlfriend or a wife who was this, could I go along with it? And I reckon, <laughs> I reckon I could go along with a, a wife if she was a vegetarian or a vegan. I I could easily adjust to that. But I also, if she was, I bet if she hunted, smoked, if she hunted her own meat and then brought it home, and I, I could also live with that. Uh-huh. So I'm clearly not a fundamentalist enough about veganism mm. either way. We talk about um, a concept all for content. So creators these days living a life where everything is geared towards yeah. capturing a moment when you've been capturing moments uh, along your journey for, you know for 15 20 years um is there a sense when you're because i think there's a there's a disconnection when you have a all for content approach when you're in a uh, rally and there's alt right guys with nazi tattoos on your neck where you're like it's almost like you're behind your 
behind your face looking out like it's the TV. Mm -hmm. Is there a sense that you are disconnected when you're in these moments, when you're getting crucified in the Philippines? (laughs) Like are you legitimately experiencing it or are you going, are you thinking telly, 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 telly? Camera angles. Camera angles. This is great. Oh, yes, sort of both. So it's not insincere because I'm I'm interested in these things because I'm interested in them. So I'd I'd be reading about the alt-right or about religion or whatever, you know, if I worked at an accounting firm. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's not like yeah, yeah. insincere. But, yeah, they're, they're once the rubber hits the road and you're out there, like it, like it is clicking away in your head. Well, I guess the, the other side of that but, is but, are you reducing the actual – perception of danger in these situations based on the awful content? Uh, oh, oh, so am I not aware of what danger I'm in? Yes, I, I think that's true, where it's usually I'm back home a couple of days later and I'm thinking, <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have kind of poked at that. Well, it's like the guy or, in uh, Vanuatu yeah. that you were sort of pushing and prodding yeah, yeah. and you specifically talk about that in the podcast. Is, is that a uh, – the stuff around the release forms – I find yeah. that interesting. There was a couple of times in the podcast where you say they didn't sign a release form. Yeah. Is this a new thing where companies are sort of more uh, aware and cautious or is this something that you've had to deal with your whole life? Uh, I think uh, it's just dif- different for different projects. So, yeah, yeah so definitely uh, yeah, we had to, I had to get release forms to for the Audible project. And then when I couldn't get, get them, we had to work out creative ways around around how to kind of express what the person had expressed without broadcasting their voice. But often that stuff is kind of fun. What yeah. about the interaction, trying to get someone who doesn't want to sign a release form? Do you do any really good convincing where you got it across the line? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm really not that good at that. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty awkward even going up to people. In a even in a non-confrontating way. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the whole thing of trying to upsell someone to sign a release form is very difficult. I mean, there's not really even a sell because there's what's in it for them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> when you're walking up to a door in Mississippi, some little town, and you're about to knock on it, yeah. Like, what's going through your head in these situations where you're totally out of what you know is normal? Uh, a, a lot of it. I'm, I'm driven a lot by shame. <laughs> and and so a lot of it if i hadn't if i hadn't like signed the book contract <laughs> i'm I, I am i'm thinking like i just have to do this it's like it's uncomfortable I, like once once you've i cross the threshold and i'm talking to the person behind the doors cuz like most people aren't not like it's rude or anything that they're kind of curious about why someone's asking or whatever and so once i'm finally talking to them it's all fine but yeah it is freaking uncomfortable mm. like to knock on the door and but that, that's why I always have like business cards printed out because it just makes it look like what you're doing is sort of, this is normal. A bit know? more legit. Yeah, a bit more legit. I feel like uh, my character, if you will, I couldn't get away with putting myself in these situations. I'd be, I'd, I'd stand out like a fucking sore thumb and they'd just be like, who's this wanker? Do you feel <laughs> like, how, how do you go into these? Maybe you're just being you, but how, how do you enter scenarios where, you know, you're overseas and, and you've got to sort of go undercover. Like how do you not stand out? Is there anything? Oh, I, I prefer overseas where people don't know me whilst even like in New Zealand like, uh, when I was there last week, like it was pretty normal. And also people just Google you as well. So even if they don't know you, they can know you pretty soon. And, yeah, I'd prefer not to be known but, mm. you know, just for the sake of getting the work. And then, but then I kind of I put that into the books because that kind of can become like good content for the books. That yeah. the other person's like really suspicious of me because they know who I am, and <laughs> yeah, so everything just su- suddenly becomes like shtick, mm. you know. So I feel like your content's been on the border of like, um, not getting cancelled, but on the <laughs> on the line of just really sort of. Uh, not distasteful, but just in people's eyes, like really sort of shocking, right? Yeah. Like when you got crucified, I remember it was a – what year was that that you did that? Uh, uh, maybe 2000 – it was either 2008 or 2009. And um, his, his rig was looking great because he trained very hard for it. But I remember the time of like it, it, you know, coming through the news, but it wasn't like now where there's – it's it, stuff gets plastered everywhere. Mm-hmm. And you see people like Chris Lilly who have – 
sort of pushed it a little bit too far. Is there a consideration of where the line is and how far you're pushing up to it? Uh, for me, it's more what people will accept from their the character of me. So, yeah. so, uh, so th- there was an element, not so much with taste or whatever, but where I, I stopped doing pranky stuff just because times had moved on. So w- when I'd started doing that that genre. I was a bit ahead of the curve and so it was, like, interesting. And then it just became the, the, the culture. Like, everyone was doing it. Like, mm. everyone was just doing this sort of pranking stuff. So then I just stopped doing it because I just thought, oh, it just kind of doesn't work anymore for me, not mm. for other people, but for me. And it doesn't work because when I started doing that, I was, like, in my early 20s, so people's audiences are kind of like, oh, someone in their early 20s is kind of a teenager, so he's kind of a teenager mm. doing these wacky things. And, yeah, but then you hit your whatever, you're past 35 and do they really want to see some middle-aged man sort of, <laughs> yeah. you know, dre- <laughs> dress, dressed up as an elf <laughs> skipping around Parliament House trying to zing Julia Gillard or whatever. Yeah, so most of my decisions are more come from that perspective of like, more like a creative perspective of, like, is an audience going to like this or not? Mm. Like, I mean, we were into prank stuff years and years mm. ago, and then it's like I think we've as as an audience not creating that stuff. Are like, we're kind of you've you know I've talked about that yeah. big YouTubers, ten million subscribers, built off the back of a prank channel, and now they're yeah. they're vloggers with a hot girlfriend. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's just travel. The um the thing on shame, the difference can you can you basically have shame and also be happy at the same time? Uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. I think I think if there was balance, you can. Mm-hmm. If uh, but it, yeah, if you're totally overwrought by shame the whole time, then no, you're not happy. How do you control your shame? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I pull down the curtains in my flat, make sure no one can see me, <laughs> hide away. It it, get, it gets sort of like harder to hide away the more. Uh, like especially now because the internet's everywhere or whatever, you can't even think about. Although I never really could. Like I remember after that show where I got crucified, I was just feeling a bit like under the microscope. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just take a holiday. I got to New Zealand and I went to New Zealand and I wanted to just like escape and hide. And then like whatever, within like forty five minutes, someone said, "Hey, you're John Safran," oh. <laughs> and so. So, yeah, you can't hide anymore. Is the shtick a <coughs> coping mechanism? Like do you feel that the shtick makes you a character and so then you can separate between the actions of that character? Well, yeah, I, de- I definitely have to. There's no way I'd be doing like awkward prank-like thing if it wasn't for material or whatever. But I don't know. There's another side to it. Like like you get to like research this stuff and you have an excuse to do it. So – I get like I bet a lot of people would be kind of really curious about a, this a murder or about cigarette companies or about whatever, and then but you're not allowed to just knock on people's doors mm-hmm. if you're not writing a book. So it's kind of cool that way. Is there a difference? Like, what's the main difference between everyday John behind the the curtains mm-hmm. and the John that's out and about doing interviews and speaking and writing books? Uh I don't know, like, like when, when I write books and I guess also for my docos, it's like an edited heightened version of you. So, and I used to like that a lot. But as I said, like life's moved on. People don't like ambiguity as much anymore. Mm-hmm. I used to love that my persona on TV, it was hard to figure out what was real and what wasn't. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, yeah, that's cool. Like, because that's what entertainment, that's what art is. And, but now like people really want, people get really, uh, annoyed and agitated when there's when there's sort of like not clarity. Mm. <laughs> so even my my last book about extremists, I, there, there were things where I was like trying to create this this disorienting effect, which I think I did, <laughs> but <laughs> but like I, I didn't really like underline and highlight things and what you're meant to be thinking as the reader. And and I got a bit of blowback for that because you you leave yourself open because then. You haven't said it, so therefore other people can uh, kind of spin what you've said. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, so I think my next book, uh, I probably will be talking about, about a bit of this stuff we've talked about where it's about how, okay, fine, you want to know my freaking opinion? Here it is. 
And I do a boring paragraph with the most boring conclusion that, you know, getting lung cancer is bad. <laughs> but do you think that's safer? <laughs> like do you think, like I guess thinking about if you were to take on anyone, yeah. it feels like the tobacco industry, it's a, it's a fairly safe thing versus maybe the nuance of dealing with things like racism and, and those types of no, I guess I guess I'll see, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, like, like all 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 worlds are really interesting, and once you kind of start diving into it, there's all these little internal battles between different subcultures and different worlds within worlds, and uh, uh, yes, yeah, so basically, I'm sure I'll get in trouble anyway. <laughs> Is there a commonality okay. between the people who are in these subcultures, mm. deep in them? Is there a commonality in their personalities or who yeah, gravitates towards yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. There's like the search for meaning. So I don't know if everyone has this yearning to have like meaning in their lives, but uh, yeah, that, that's definitely like an element of like people on the far right and who get involved in the far right and in a totally different way, totally different way if anyone's uh, like, like people who are uh, the grassroots people who've got involved in vaping or whatever is – uh, it's like this search for meaning. Like everyone, everyone wants, uh, like to feel like they're doing something that has purpose, and you know they feel, they feel like a hole in their in their world or whatever. And then is that, that's why it's really cool if you grew up like in a religion or in like an ethnic group because a lot of that's put in place when you're young, so you don't have to yearn for it or go out into strange places to find it. But then, uh, yeah, so there's lots of the people. Lots, but like people on the the far right that I met when I was researching my last book, like there, there was an element of yeah, people were just like yearning for meaning in their life. Mm. I, I think that like uh, document like Netflix and all the documentaries that you, you find the ones that are really popular, so uh, game changers, mm. uh, veganism, vegetarianism, um, is heightened. Where does Scientology sit at the moment <laughs> in terms of its uh, uh, its I, I guess relevance to Criticism in the mainstream. Uh, I think uh, it was really banking on being secretive, and with the internet, it's really hard to be secretive <laughs> anymore. So, it yeah, it lost a bit of its kind of psychic energy and kind of <laughs> I don't know zeitgeist power when suddenly, like, you can just read all their secret documents because they're just uh, uploaded a million times in a, in a different a million sites or whatever. So. It was the same with the Freemasons where as soon as they were like, hey, man, we're not going to be secretive anymore. So, you like, come to our open day. It's like, <laughs> well, yeah, what's the point? Like, that was the point of you being Freemasons. It was that it was secretive. Like, that was what made it awesome. Yeah. And now you've sort of handed over the most awesome, you know, you've traded the most awesome thing, which is the secrets. Yeah, what else is out there that, I mean, is there any new ones that have come up? It's a weird time for new religions like mm-hmm. Scientology to start out, I guess. But if anyone's to know, it's you, John. Uh, no, I haven't really. Uh, I haven't really fallen into any new cults. She's just clouded out from the vape smoke. The vape. <laughs> Are you an introvert? Yeah, I guess so. In in some ways, yes. In some ways, yes. Yes. You say yeah. it with a bit of. Uh, uh, I don't know. I. I, I do, what do you think? I'm an introvert. I think you're an introvert. Okay, cool. But yeah, I, 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 some people would probably have apprehension based on seeing. Some people might think it's negative. I don't think it is, but I think there's negative connotations attached to someone who is an introvert in an extrovert world. Um, I think there's, there's actually a great book on that. Josh, you've was I, it you I'm that showed sure me? I'm pretty sure I own it, but I haven't read it. <laughs> this is a classic move by me. Are you an introvert, Josh? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. But I think look what you're both doing. I mean, you've forged a career out of a thing that comes yeah. across as only ext- extroverts yeah. or it's an extroverted action. Yeah. Do you find it different? Like on a, on a Saturday night, what's the ultimate uh, John Saturday night? What does that look like? Uh, I don't know. Wandering around my house <laughs> drunk <laughs> with my illegal firearm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, th- thinking about all my enemies, <laughs> pretty much that. I don't know. I've, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I hang out with friends, so it's not, you know. No, but I'm not, like, positioning as I want you to give it the introverted yeah, answer. Yeah, yeah. But what, seriously, what is it? Uh, I'm, well, what did I do? What's a perfect, uh, we talk about the perfect day. 
Oh, okay. If you were to describe oh, okay. the so perfect definitely, day. So, so probably like what I'd want to do is I'd just want to uh, spend time in as opposed to out, but have a, a friend or some friends mm-hmm. over also and then maybe. Like a small group. Like, yeah, because small. I like I like people. Yeah, but I don't like too many people. Yeah, yeah. And so sure. having one or two people over is good. Yeah, and are then you begin to Uber Eats. Uh, what exactly are you accusing me of? <laughs> <laughs> that is connected with why I'm going on an eight day kind of <laughs> boot camp. No, I love Uber. I'm, I use it all. The, the delivery thing I use all the time. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's 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 definitely tempting. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but that that is part of um. Yeah, that. But you, you probably have hit upon something about how that's making that's feeding into people's mm. introvert do you hate them. the idea of ordering a coffee i hate going up and being like like uh mr 97 and i were uh, on a shoot earlier today and i went to um macca's because i could just do the i didn't have to <laughs> oh yeah and do the whole i think it's it's whether it's like shame eating or not so i mm-hmm. wouldn't consider a coffee shameful so i'd be happy to go and order it from the barista or mm-hmm. whatever but What's you're right. your coffee order uh, I have long blacks, and but I also have flat whites. I'm not a, I'm not like really very fundamentalist. Mm-hmm. I, I, I jump around. Okay, sure. And so you, uh, so you're fine with that sort of that sort of interaction. interaction. Oh yeah, for sure. But I, I think I think one of the yeah yeah. So I live I live on a street where there's like lots of cafes or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm happy to kind of go down there and kind of soak up a bit of uh, humanity. Mm-hmm. What's December like as a month for you? Man, you really are like, are you lonely? <laughs> you not, maybe look I'm projecting. That, look at that ledge over there. <laughs> but my December. Well, this is. You could have a fucking great December. Well, I am having a great. I'm going. It God damn, like on, I, I'm going to. A, well, last. No, I've had a good December, I guess. Because I, I went. I spent a week in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Two days of that at the Vape Expo. And then a few more days where the, the Vape Emperor of New Zealand, he's like, he runs like the big company. Yeah. And so I went on a bit of a, a you know, a, a tour with him and we went to Hobbiton. Not just oh, me and him, yeah. but it, me, me and him and some va- American vape suppliers or whatever. And Are know, they vaping as they're going? Like oh, yeah, there's a lot of, form? yeah. So that is, I kind of wish I was filming this in some ways because I don't know how I'm going to describe it because often when you describe things, it sounds like you're making some judgment. And so, yeah, <laughs> it is going to be hard like it is like we we're white water rafting for six hours and all the vapors on there like the vaping industry like they had their like vapes tucked into <laughs> there and and there's lots of the vaping all the time and they vape around the workplace and everything yeah so it's it's definitely a thing we we're went rafting. into we went into a friend's office oh yeah he's he's built a quite a big business got you know fifteen employees and his um, general manager comes out of his office. Just this big plume of vape. <laughs> I just thought there was something so comical about it. Mm-hmm. Like he had a tight shirt on, indoors, yeah. this huge cloud coming out. There's some sort of like mad, mad uh, men. Mad, mad men, mo- modern day mad yeah, men. Like yeah. I just couldn't help but laugh at him. <laughs> um, the, what's with the white water rafting? Okay. So anyway, so the, I'm saying my December was good, despite you trying to paint me as <laughs> some lunatic lo- loner, where... I spent a week in New Zealand. Like that was last week and mm-hmm. there was whitewater rafting. That, that, it's just because it was organised. Uh-huh. I'd never whitewater rafted it before. But then, so I've come back and then there's this stretch of uh, late December where you can't really work because mm-hmm. e- everyone is out of the office and all that stuff like that. So I thought I'd, go, I'd do a health kick. Because you, you've been around where I've done health kicks. Yeah, so yeah. I'm quite good at like. Where the, does the health kick come from? It's usually because I have Obsession. to appear. I have to appear on uh, TV or something mm-hmm. like that. So I, I've. Did you uh, lost twelve or fourteen kilos or something? Like, in, and it wasn't that you were holding a heap. Yeah. But you got he got super lean. You were doing the chicken and broccoli. You got to a point you were cooking mm-hmm. chicken in the microwave. Yeah. That's fucking dedication. Animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've done that probably half a dozen or more times. Where, like, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. Is that really, a shame thing? Yeah, I'm not really that into exercise, but I am. I'm. I, I can kind of get obsessive about mm-hmm. something. So, it, but then it kind of like becomes your life. Like, well, like mm-hmm. when I was like losing weight for the TV show, it, it, it's sort of like you plan your day around it. Mm. So I, I find it really hard to multitask. Like, 
uh, exercise to lose weight and also not be a lunatic. Mm. So what do you think about – because I used to be 120 kilos. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's your – And he used to stay indoors, windows down, exactly. you know, blinds down. Yeah. Uber. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what, what is your relationship with food? Yeah, I've got a bad relationship with food. So, yeah, yeah. So part of going on the eight-day whitewater rafting is I'm just thinking – because I guess for a lot of people it'd be you like, make. it's like, oh, I, I want to see the beautiful uh-huh. whatever it is. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Rock <laughs> scenery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scenery. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, for me I'm thinking, oh, a bit like when I was training with you, I'm going, oh, this is really cool. It'll be like this eight-day boot camp where I'm like for six hours a day I'm paddling and stuff. I Have think you, it's a, it is a good idea. You can't really eat while you're mm-hmm. but doing if it's, it. Yeah, but I guess from the shame, what people have been opening my eyes to is it's like, if that comes from that place of shame, is it actually, sir, if you're like smashing yourself, yeah. is that positive long-term? Yes. Yeah, you think so? Uh, yeah, because I've, done, I've, I've got healthy enough, like re- quite healthy enough times to know you feel better. Mm-hmm. And so it's not, like, it's not like some abstract thing. What do you think of balance then? How do you, because everyone says, oh, no, you just need a balanced diet and do things. Oh, yeah, obviously. And- yeah, yeah, that's probably okay. Nothing against that. But there's also nothing against, people. Would, I think people do kind of exaggerate the dangers of getting healthy a bit much. Mm-hmm. Like when, like in the overall scheme of things, yeah. it's not like the problem with the world is too many people are trying to get healthy. It's definitely <laughs> not my problem. And so, yeah, so, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's fine. Mm. Do you think there's a difference between health and weight loss? Uh, yeah, obviously on some – well, you have to get some expert in about mm. that. But then uh, also I don't kind of like I, – I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't try to overthink it that much. Mm-hmm. So, no, th- there is a connection between weight loss and health mm-hmm. and that you'll just be – one will, will – depending on – you know, obviously there's outlier cases where it's mm. like not like that, but – yeah, generally speaking, you know, if you're a bit uh, wobbly, then, <laughs> well, then, yeah, actually, I've then no- you can like, yeah, like if you lost, a, you lost, say, 120 to how much do you weigh uh, now? I probably weigh 93 now. I yeah, reckon. so how, like, why even have some, like, abstract intellectual conversation about whether are the pros, and, like, mm. clearly, like. Well, uh, I how- felt good, I felt good doing it, but then. Mm. People say, oh, no, like that's not like yeah, your that- obsession isn't good. Like your approach isn't right. Like you're uh, you're uh, eating dark chocolate and that's great, but that's not a proper meal. You need to eat a meal. Okay. Well, obviously everything, you know, in moderation or whatever. But, yeah, generally but don't you think speak- that's a bit of a cop out, the whole moderation thing? Are you a guy of moderation? You're going well, on no. a fucking eight days. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, so I'm on your side. I'm same pro shit. you. I'm against the people <laughs> but who you're are spinning you. the, the moderation shit. You're spinning the same shit. No, that I was they talking are. about how there's some outlier cases where, like, if, if someone is already healthy and is of a healthy weight, you know, th- that's my asterisk. But is the if moderation some, if, thing? If someone's already healthy of a healthy weight, like, it's probably not handy mm. to have people saying, oh, yeah, it's totally cool if you try to lose mm. weight. But, like, for everyone else who's just a bit. Uh, wobbly, mm-hmm. like it probably, it probably is fine. I, I used to always consider <laughs> moderation balance as people not wanting me to lose weight. Yeah. Like almost a thing yeah. of like, yeah. oh, you're holding back the actual secret of just cut out carbs. Yeah. No, no, the, the, yeah, the, you, you're right to be paranoid. I'm, like, I'm I on your side. A, I think what you, what you might be saying is a simplistic view or a simplistic piece of advice from somebody. Moderation mm. is like what your mum says when yeah. you have stolen seven bars of chocolate yeah. and yeah. smashed them. The long term, the long term results from moderation could be the the answer. Mm-hmm. It's the hardest thing though, yeah. because I think in the cases like you were training for months with me and and you got such results, and I trained a bunch of people for the same time that got no results, but they weren't as Hell bent and obsessed on achieving something and doing everything that re- required. You, I could make you lose thirty kilos if you listened to everything I said. Would you even want to? Absolutely well, I just not. Don't, but the, we no, all but know I, what we're going to do. No, if you don't eat, you'll lose. John didn't know what to do. I mean, I told him what to do. Yeah, I need be- bene- benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a dictator, and it worked, didn't it, John? Yeah, it was good. You look great. Um, money and being a creator. I think young creators these days, it's a harder. Maybe, maybe a harder route to, uh, you know, a hard track to go down to convert 
your filmmaker or storytelling abilities into cash. Well, struggling yeah. artists have been around for a long time. No, I well. guess. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess. I mean, what's your view on money and being a creator? Uh, like, what's yeah, your, it is, what's it, your it, relationship? No, with no, money? It, def- it definitely seems uh, easier to get stuff published these days or to film stuff because equipment's much cheaper and you can upload anything to YouTube and you can yeah, which ro- could write, say- it, write anything on Medium. But, yeah, yeah when it yeah. comes to converting that to money, that can be more difficult than in the old days. Even amongst – like like in the old days, I guess, I guess like in my early 20s, I, I managed to slip through where I was one of the really lucky ones who like people wanted to commission work from. So and, – and, and, and there is an element that the lucky ones these days don't get – paid as well as mm, like mm-hmm. like when it comes to uh like if you're a, a well respected writer or something and then whatever what the guardian or i don't know who i don't know what their rate is but you know like the rate per word mm. hasn't gone up since the 90s so yeah, yeah. well yeah. i mean more people can make videos these days doesn't mm. mean that if there's more people making videos it's harder the pool of money mm. is being accessed by more people Lowering the amount that people can make. And there's probably a long tail of people making absolutely nothing as well. Yeah. Like happy but with it just being a hobby. I, I don't think it's that though. I don't think people are making less money because the pool's bigger or something like that or whatever you said. It's just publishers can get away with not paying people. Why is that though? Supply and demand, more people, right? Yeah, something like that. But I'm, I mean it, it probably will kind of, what do you call it, recalibrate or mm-hmm. something because – uh, like I even remember like BuzzFeed has gone through a few stages where like their first thing was, oh, well, we don't need any writers because we just need listicle writers. And then – but then they were searching for writers that had sort of like a reputation mm-hmm. because then that made the brand look stronger or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know enough about the topic, but, it, yeah, it, I find it really frustrating. Not, not me personally because I fortunately have – Figured out a way to, um, so I'm not whining on behalf of myself. I'm whining on behalf <laughs> of other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there is something so frustrating about how people go on the internet because they want to read the news and like find out things. And somehow, uh, so the Age in Australia and the Sydney Morning Herald in America, the New York Times or whatever, they're the ones who are providing all this. Yet somehow, they don't get all the money. You know, it's mm. like Google AdSense and Facebook or the equivalents. Like, why do they? I just don't get it because mm. it's not. It's not like uh, newspapers are going out of business because people don't want to read newspapers, like or newspaper sites. It's they're going out of business because Facebook and Google have figured out how to take all the money and and the money doesn't yeah. stay with the uh, the Age and the New York Times. Therefore. That, yeah, they can't pay mm. writers as much. If you had to do your career again, mm. what what do you think? You, what medium would you choose? How would, do you think you could find success in it again? Uh, well, at the moment, I'm really enjoying – I have this, this fantasy world that for some reason I know how to write fiction and like screenplays or something and then I can just sit at home and be hidden – and, and write it. <laughs> Says the not. I feel like you're revealing your cards. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm a, yeah. but, crying in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crying in December. So I, I'd like to do that, I guess. But where's the appeal? What's the appeal in that? Is it the action of being alone writing? Oh, uh, I don't know. It's just more like you feel vulnerable, like walking out the front door. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it would just be a, a balance to that. Except I, I just. You have to like count your blessings and not be so whiny or whatever. So the reason I have to do the work the way I do it is because the way I have worked out how to tell stories is I go out there and I record conversations and I record my thoughts in in the moment I'm living them. And then after I piece that all together and then it becomes a story that people want to read. And that's, I can't do that without going through that process. Mm. So I couldn't, I, I, well, I had to write, I, I mentioned before I wrote this one hour kind of uh, episode of television, this uh, fiction that was a thriller or whatever. Anyway, so I was in the writer's room with the other writers and you kind of like plot out what the general gist of the episodes or whatever. And then when I got home, I still treated, I had to write, actually write things myself. I still treated it as if it was, I was doing a documentary. So for instance, there was a bit where these guys break into a car and I was like, well, I don't know how to break into a car. And then so I put out on Instagram 
I said, oh, does anyone here know how to break into a car? And then, yeah, I got the DM, you know, whatever, 15 minutes later. And then like an hour later, I'm down the street with these two guys <laughs> and they're telling me how to break into a car and I'm sort of taking notes and recording what they're saying. And then, yeah, and then I go back to my flat and then I sort of like write the scene based on that. So I still, even with fiction, I, I, I still need to treat it like doco because I just don't know how to do it any other way. I love it. So you live the scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can actually reflect it. It's great. What makes a good subject in regards like the, the person, what do they need to bring to the table? Oh, well, one really cool thing about writing about crime, which is obviously not good for the victims or for the person put in jail for stabbing the victim, but one of the good things when you're a writer is that um, it's an in basically that like there's no boring murders and also everyone's interesting or nearly everyone's interesting and it's just they mightn't seem interesting generally because they're not put in this sort of like high-pressure situation where – they uh, have to reveal themselves or have to sort of like really, you know, test what they believe and everything. So, uh, pr so many people are interesting. It, it, it re um, and in fact, one of my regrets of my, my last week in New Zealand was because I was so focused on the cigarette companies. When I was hanging out with all the vaping people, I, I feel like I was too reductive and I was like, oh, we're, we're going through Hobbiton. That's that Hobbit film set mm -hmm, away. Yeah. And it goes, I won't, I won't record this because. It's not about vaping, even though, and then just when I came back home, I was just going, oh, I should have just recorded more of that because people are just interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, anyway, so, yep, people are pretty interesting. And so, but situations where that are interesting is where, yeah, is where it's something that's generally hidden from us and you figure out a way to get in there and peek behind the curtain. And, yeah, that's what's interesting. What about people who do shtick? So you talk about you've yep. got shtick. <clears throat> does shtick make for good characters or does it make it harder? Oh, uh, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, like there, there, is a, there is a thing these days where everyone's so used to, everyone's watched reality TV and, and also everyone, like, uploads all their thoughts all the time on the internet. So everyone's in a performance all the time. So sometimes that, that isn't great. That can be kind of. Like, like for if if I'm meeting someone and they they're doing that, then that, that that's not always great. Although I guess it could be great if I was mm. somehow made that their thing. You know, like they're doing shtick. But, <laughs> but I, I have occasionally, like I've gone to parties or whatever, and then the first back and forth with people is like a bit of sarcastic stuff, and then I kind of want to ease into just the normal conversation, and they won't let go. And then, so then it's like two minutes later, three minutes later. And no matter what I do to try to like land them on, like, oh, can we just ease into like the normal conversation and not the thing where you say the sarcastic thing that's the reverse of what you really mean. Mm. And like, yeah, it can't, yeah, that, that, that can be, um, that, that can be not great. I think I've observed that and with you and so people in the gym and if we went down mm. Carlos street where the gym was, it may be based on the shtick that you put out, you know, the joker, the the prankster or oh, yeah. someone mm -hmm. pushing the boundaries. People, like I remember hearing one person in particular how they would speak to you and it was that sarcasm and like, you know, it's like, ah, we're it's the joke. We got the joke here. <laughs> they think they're doing improv all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like, hey, you know, it's like I'm, I'm a worse person than them. So I'm not, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm, in, in general, so I'm not like judging them or whatever. No. Like, like I wish I was such a good person that the worst thing about me was I did shtick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think if we look at our characters as the shtick, so mm. I, I, you probably ha have a better interpretation of my shtick than I do. You definitely, as your shtick, you never talk about having shtick. <laughs> but I your hair shtick, is mate. your shtick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's, if I was to pinpoint it for myself, it's like, it's almost the confident PT. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I haven't left John. Yeah. I'm still the confident do you still PT. PT. Not at all. I, Not I at train all. myself. <laughs> I train myself, but I can't. Once a PT, always a PT. Can't shake it. <laughs> uh, overthinking. Are you uh, someone who uh, gets into that? Yeah. There's, there's, no real, <laughs> there's no real denying that. But, yeah, that, that's probably why I should get married or something because then you just have to just get married, have a kid, and then, like, other things will just fill up the space and mm -hmm. then you won't have the luxury of overthinking. Yeah. It'll be it's like, a good, it's a yeah. good point. What about self-talk? You talk about all the shame and all that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Do you actually, like, 
if you if you actually just because I think there's a sense that you you can definitely take your what you say on face value. Yeah. And at face value, it's funny, it's shtick and all yeah. that sort of thing. But I guess I enjoy the next level of like someone who lives in that space yeah. could also go through, mo- like I guess you've got like the uh, super highs but also like the lower points where it's not serving you. Mm. Do you feel Do you feel that or have you created some magical world where you can uh, be negative to yourself and still feel, be okay with it? Oh no, I'm not, no, I'm not okay with it. But I do, I do try to ride it out and not fight it too much. I, I don't know if this is quite what you're asking, but I remember when the last election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and there just became a point where people were going, "Oh, people aren't listening to her anymore." Like she can try to come up with the best argument, and she can mm-hmm. have the best arguments, but like it's just not flowing her way for, for anymore. So, so I definitely like feel that, like where I kind of. Put projects out, and I feel like I'm, on, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm riding the wave. And then there'll be something else where I feel like it's not quite connecting with an audience as much. Or, and, but yeah, and, and rather than fighting it, I realise like there's nothing you can do about that. So you just sort of just have to kind of ride it out a bit, mm-hmm. and sort of like look at the long game or whatever. Mm-hmm. What about like, uh, say, like I'm thinking of my own personal examples, shame or whatever associated yes. with like, ah. Oh. With being 130. Yeah, exactly. 120. He put uh, a bit of salt and pepper on it, didn't he? <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Uh, no, I guess like the the day-to-day shame or being like, oh, I don't go out enough or I don't do this or I don't oh, do yeah. that. yeah, I have a lot of shame around. I can't believe when I look at the book, like that I've written these books. because <laughs> Procrastination? That, that, do you do get into procrastination? I do, I do procrastinate. I'm both lazy and a workaholic. I don't know how it works <laughs> or whatever. Like probably I'm sort of quite proud of my last book, how I, I, from day one, because usually with my books, I, I get a bit confused about when I started it and then when it finished or whatever. But my last book about extremists, I, I know the day I first went to do my first day of research because it was based on this rally and I can just type into Google, oh, that rally happened on the 4th of May, 2015 or something like that. And then I stopped writing the book basically the day Donald Trump was elected. So that's another date or whatever. And then the book got a release date. And I can't believe, you know, like how many words are in a book? I somehow goddamn wrote this book like in 12 months and then it got out a bit, just a bit after that mm-hmm. or whatever. So, and that seems really weird to me because I, I know inside me I'm really lazy and a procrastinator. So and does I just that make it all feel better then? Because maybe yeah. like that internal voice of like, I fucking did it. Yeah. Is, the, is, is that sort of the uh, the contrast that makes it okay? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I just I reckon there'd have to be just a little nudge, and I'd be so much better at um, working. I don't know what mm-hmm. I what I've done wrong, but yeah, but at least but I have got the stuff out there eventually. And then then you find out, particularly in writing, is like authors are such procrastinators. So over at Penguin, like I'm feeling guilty because I'm like two weeks late with some draft or whatever. And then you just hear the story that there's this other writer and, like, they're four years late. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell was I, like, pulling my hair out being two weeks late? But, yeah. The, the format of podcasts yes. and interviews, because you are an overthinker and you enjoy the meta and you enjoy sarcasm, yep. do you find it hard to lean into formats? Or if you see something, so say for, like, a, a podcast, some of the interviews go into this sort of deep, past and going into like uh you know what were you like as a kid oh yeah do you find that you push back on formats or cliches no no not at all i I reckon podcasts are really cool and and so if i'm like pushing back on anything it's just like a a regular person would be like oh i don't really want to like show my bad side you know i don't i don't want to show my emotional 120 kilogram side (laughs) 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 and uh and so, yeah, it'd just be that. But do you know what I'm really into now, which isn't quite podcast, is... Vaping. <laughs> Besides, whilst I'm at home vaping, I like to... I, I'm sure everyone does this, where you, like, fall down these uh, YouTube rabbit holes about subjects that you have no interest in, like, on the surface level, mm-hmm. but then on this deeper level, because everything's about, like, tribalism and, like, little wars and pettiness and revenge and, or whatever... And so you start like listen, listening to these things and, it, and they're like the soap operas that are kind of nourishing you. And so the thing at the moment, 
and it's a really great time to be into this for the last couple of months. And I'm, I have nothing against science fiction. I have nothing against Star Wars or Doctor Who or whatever. It's just not my jam. You know, yeah, I've never yeah. been into it. And I don't know how it started, but I fell into the YouTube embittered former Star Wars obsessive who now thinks, uh, you know, Disney has ruined it all. And <laughs> and there's there's quite a few of those uh, channels. They're, 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 they're like fundamentalists. They're simultaneously like really into Star Wars, but they they just think uh, Disney has just screwed it up <laughs> and that The Last Jedi ruined it all. And there's uh, – um, now there's this moment where, because the last film's about to come up, I think like next week or whatever, but it's been like building in this kind of apocalyptic sense, you know, like if the, someone's in a cult and it's like the end days is going to be this date on the December the 12th or the whole world's going to end and there's like this this throbbing kind of world going on. So, it's, yeah, so for that, that little scene they've been like, building and building and building for months because it's, <laughs> it's all going to end next week where Rise of the Jedi and they really want it or Rise of S- Skywalker and it's like they really want it to be shit, to be shit because they've been building and building and 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 they're, they're kind of obsessive and scary in a way because they know the names of like the crew members on, you know, <laughs> like, I, like I get, you know, the name George Lucas. Like mm-hmm. I know the name George Lucas. It's like, why do you know the name of the, you know, the second AD <laughs> <laughs> on the Mandalorian or whatever? I mean, they're, they're putting the focus into something that you would, but it yep. is actually a job for you. I think, like, um, starting out as a creator, it's you need to have passion projects because you don't have any body of work to prove that you should be paid or yep. you should be signed to write a book. Is there a few books in TV shows? Are you doing passion projects that aren't connected to someone signing you on for it or uh, <clears throat> well, we got no time? No, that's not true. I, I do a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Is it spec work? I don't know what you know. I do. I do a lot of things where I'm like writing up ideas that sort of for whatever reason end up going nowhere. So I'm doing that all the time. And and I, I remember I was going, when, when I was writing for this magazine, Good Weekend, uh, and I was doing like crime stories for them. I was just doing a lot of poking around where I'd like turn up to court. I, like I'd hear <laughs> something through someone else and turn up to court and you spend like the day in court and that, that thing wouldn't go anywhere. And my, and my last book about extremists, the starting point was exactly, exactly that where it was just on, uh, I saw roll into my Facebook feeds, this, uh, like, oh, it was like this left wing counter rally. that was like, oh, skinheads are going to be on the streets of Melbourne. And I was like, what the f- yeah. And, you know, outside Parliament House and I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, I, what? Skinheads? Like, I, I don't think I've seen a skinhead except, you know, in Romper Stomper or whatever. Yeah. And so I just, like, got on the train that morning and, you know, just hung out there and sort of, like, took it all in and then realised there was a story there that kind of ended up. And then, then, then I, 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 it started off as tweets. I was writing all these sarcastic tweets about the – the skinheads and stuff like uh, oh, I'm at the rally here this morning at the Reclaim Rally in Melbourne. So if you see me, come over and say hail and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing all this stuff, and then someone from I think the Herald Sun or uh, uh, contacted me and said, "Oh, can you write an article about that?" Because like you had all those good tweets, or and then I wrote an article about that, like just an 800 word piece or something. And mm. then through that, that's when yeah, I went to Penguin, and then. Like became a book or whatever. So, so, so yeah, so, you so I, I do a lot of poking around. I also do. I write up so many ideas. If you spoke to a couple of the producers I work with, I reckon you'd be surprised, like how many, like, because you get these kind of like fishing exhibitions from mm. either networks or whatever, where it's like, oh, John, we love. It. Can you? Oh, love, oh, please, please, any idea or whatever. And, yeah. and so then you spend like whatever a week. Coming up with that, and it kind of ends up going nowhere. Yeah, and so, yeah, so I've got quite a big filing cabinet filled with that. And so, you, yeah, so you keep them are these hard copies. Yeah, how do you digital? capture the ideas? Are yeah. they happening in a sort of controlled environment where you're like, okay, ABC want me to present a bunch of ideas, so I'm going to come up with fifteen, or is it like you're on the tram and you've you've come up with something? Uh, I don't know. It's a bit of both or whatever. The yeah. So I, often they want something that's, uh, you know, in in the ballpark in, in the th- themes of my mm. pre. Yeah, so yeah, obviously I became a bit of the 
hey, Safran's a guy who knows a lot about the alt-right and extremists and ISIS and stuff. So I got a lot of people allegedly wanting ideas around that, which I kind of wrote up many times in many different ways and just didn't go nowhere. What about like notes? Like are you on your iPhone yeah, putting yeah, I, in? Yeah, yeah, I write notes or whatever and I, I jump around all, all, all the time. Like sometimes I'm convinced I need to write it on like pieces of paper. Mm-hmm. And then you're just going into your jacket yeah, pocket. There you go. Oh my god, it's oh, great these yellow. <laughs> Look, I've got this just in case. Like, oh, yeah, just right. let me just write something down He's here. Yeah, yeah. Left handed. There we go. He's saying tw- yeah. 120 kilograms. <laughs> 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 you never forget that. Yes. The, uh, <laughs> how much of that? Like, say, how much thought goes into the? Because uh, uh, I know um, Jerry Seinfeld uses yellow legal. Oh yeah. Pads for I always, all of his jokes. I reckon that's part of the process is when you are you don't have an idea, <laughs> is like you become obsessive about stationery. I do that all the time. Yeah. I, I, but I think that's How got, much obsession has gone into Like what does that say about you? The – yeah, no, I think it's part of the ritual. It's it, it's part of the ritual where mm-hmm. – but but I always find, yeah, it is kind of annoying because when you have your killer idea, it's like, oh, my God, I don't have mm-hmm. a pen and paper or whatever, mm-hmm. and you just go into Woolworths and get this like – crappy biro and scratchy thing and then you scratch it on a thing and then that becomes the idea and it's like, oh, I wish I'd written that idea with like a quill or, a, <laughs> or, or you know, a fountain pen or something. Yeah, I've gone through all of that stuff of like buying an expensive Lammy pen and buying oh, a yeah. fountain pen <laughs> and all that. Oh, my God. Just to sort of. <laughs> Sounds like a guy I know. Yeah. yeah, I've done that, yeah. It, it, it's all Because fountain pens are actually quite hard to use. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, they're no good or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I also do, I do, I, I've done, I do the, uh, oh, my phone's over there. I do the scribble and, uh-huh. and, and then scan. Okay, yeah, sure. So sure. I, when I was on the plane from New Zealand back here, I, I scribbled some ideas on a, on a serviette, just like people imagine an, uh, an artist to do. Mm. And then, or barefoot. Or barefoot. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then I just took a photo of it and, mm. or I, scan, I scanned it. What do you think the biggest misconception is about you? Uh, I don't know. Because I don't know what people think about mm. me or whatever. Well, the th- it's funny because, like, I know all the questions I'm asking, like, are it annoying to you? No, and no, so no, that, no that's I'm not, not annoyed. No, no but because I know that, like, I feel like you wouldn't have an answer. You don't have, like you don't really have an answer. I think it's because there's all these different versions of me in my work, so mm. I wouldn't know. So b- before I like did the Triple J radio show, and I was just doing like TV work. I, that was really I had a, a big control over like my image because you, you can just you can write mm. the stuff and you present it and edit it. And I always liked how that version of me, this kind of heightened version of me, wasn't really me. I mean, it was kind of an, an element of me or whatever. And so I imagine back then I could say, oh, people think I'm really like, woohoo, squeak and stuff when really I'm more. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> but then like after 10 years of mm, 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 on Triple J, now everyone knows that's part of me too. So I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Why? What do you think? What's a, what, what's a per- perception of me? And I'll tell you whether it's true or not. What's your perception, Josh, of John? Um. Yeah, you're a, like a creative overthinker mm. who uh, enjoys the friction of putting yourself in situations and then yep. writing about it. Yes. You are really interested in people uh, but also can deal with not having them at, at times. And yeah, I, I just find the, uh, yeah, I don't know. But I think that that's probably like the standard thing. I think that the, like I've, what I'm curious about is I feel like potentially I've bought into the caricature of John Safran. And so what I'm trying to do is mm. work out those, the nuances. Oh, yeah. No, that's pretty right. Yeah. I, 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 maybe. You catch in, public transport. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in, in five years time I can have turned things around. So that perception's totally at odds. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no, I don't think about that anymore. I'm just spending mm. all of my time with Well, the with thing that Tommy family. always, Tommy says about every interview, I nearly ask, uh, do you see a therapist? Uh, no, no, but people tell me I should, so that's, that's bad. <laughs> why do you think, because I, because this is, because Tommy always says, you always ask people, why haven't you gone? And I'm yeah. like, oh, well, I don't know, it seems like a lot of admin. What's the. I just feel like, uh, maybe everyone feels like this. I just feel like if I was to talk to a therapist, I'd, there'd be two things. It'd be like, shut up, John, you do know people come in here where they've got like real problems, like where they've been like tied to uh a heater by their parents 
oh. for like 10 years and hit over the head and then you're coming in here with your stupid – like so I'd be thinking that on the mm-hmm. one hand. Yeah. And then on the other hand, I reckon my problems would just be like really imb- cringy. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just too embarrassed to say them. So <laughs> it's a combination of – they're not important enough. Oh, they're not big enough compared to other people's problems. Plus, I reckon they're more cringy than other mm. people's problems. What about vulnerability? How, how has that played in your life? Because uh, there's uh, faux vulnerability. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I reckon what, uh, this doesn't quite answer your question, but I have noticed that. that <laughs> That's your favourite line. That, no, it kind <laughs> you, of you, does. Your question is shit, but I'm going to I'll no, tell no, you no, an no, anecdote no, no, about no. my fucking water rafting. No, no, no. <laughs> When I did like race around the world and that early stuff, there's a lot of me like oversharing. Mm-hmm. Like for instance, uh, talking about uh, being really hurt because the girl's just broken up with me and that's mm-hmm. why I'm in West Africa um, with these voodoo priests. I'm going to get a voodoo curse put on. Anyway, and there was a bit of like oversharing like that. But when I did it back then, people oversharing wasn't a thing because there wasn't yeah. like social media and especially like men oversharing was not a thing. So oversharing's so, in now and so yeah. you're out. So when I yeah, so yeah, exactly. So when I did that, part of the reason was it just seemed really odd that you got on TV, someone like, what the hell? Like like yeah. indulgent in a funny mm-hmm. way and whatever, and just strange. It's like, why is this person like talking about their thing? And mm-hmm. also a guy talking about it. But now life has moved on so much that I reckon when you look back at it, I just sang like a <laughs> Just don't, I, like, because every YouTuber is like a, <laughs> yeah, an yeah. oversharer. Like, it, you look back at my work, it's like, yeah, fine, John, but why aren't you crying and, you know, and all that? So, mm-hmm. what, oh, ma- well. what made you do it then? Or is it just no? I think, it was like, creative instinct. I just thought it was, uh, it just seemed kind of energetic and sort of funny and inappropriate and stuff like that. So. Mm. Just, just What's that version for you now, do you think? What are the, what are the tools, if that's like a mechanism, mm-hmm. like oversharing is a tool? Yeah. What's some other tools that you use now? Uh, I, I always, and, and, and it's really hard to do when you're in the midst of it because you don't have the bird's eye view of it all, but I, I just try to record what I'm thinking about the, the matter at hand at any point. And it's always, it's always really helpful because then when you have to write, you've got a record of mm. how, you, how, how, how you're thinking on day one is that's totally at odds with what you're thinking at. Day 13 and stuff like How that. How would you do that now if you were to give us a demo? A demo? Be the uh, be the sort of the con- like, you know. Be conf- reflection on this reflection, bloody podcast. talking <laughs> about it. Oh, yeah. So I'd say uh, I'd get your, like for my book. So first of all, I'd just be thinking, oh, how can this be helpful for my book on smoking? So I'd be trying to get your opinions on what vapors were mm-hmm. and then uh, – yeah, and then I'd record that, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then I wouldn't make a comment about your weight. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know you're not – one of the annoying things about writing, this is the most annoying thing about writing, is that you're not – writing's about describing things, and but you're just not allowed to – it just seems really bad to kind of mention that the person you're being interviewed mm. – you're interviewing is sort of um, – Well, I think you did shoving. mention – I think you mentioned um, – uh, in the Audible podcast, oh, yeah. definitely uh, the fat was one of the van- – <laughs> like I think you used fat a few times. Oh, no, that was for the fat Australians or whatever. No, no, no. 97, do you remember? What was uh, that? Yeah, it was – I can't remember what the actual word was, but, yeah, it was, it was something Maybe like Maybe portly that. or something like oh, that because yeah. there's a whole movement now. Uh, a friend of mine said, I've stopped listening to your podcast because uh, – you talk a lot about food and oh, fat and yeah. there's a whole thing around like uh, the um, – it's like intuitive eat. Have you heard of intuitive eating? Uh, uh, is that when you – Just eat what you, you fucking you, want. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the anti-diet thing. But there's a whole th- – chap- there's a bunch of chapters around culture and how all these conversations around fat and all the, and yeah. the language that we use frames up that shame. Yeah. It's almost about like – Oh, you know, letting go of that type of thing. Like how much of that, I wonder, description of this chubby person, this fat person is linked to self-image. Oh, absolutely. But I think in the, because you were talking in the, in the, in the podcast or mm-hmm. in, in the occult thing, I, I'm talking about the, how my dad came back from Vanuatu on this, oh, on, that's the, right. on, this yeah, yeah. on this boat mm-hmm. and because he went on a tour and, and his whole thing was, about how like everyone on the boat, the, the, the Australian boat, was 
like maybe 10% if that of people were of like a normal weight and everyone else was either obese obese or morbidly <laughs> obese or yeah. then or just merely a little overweight or whatever. Yeah, but there was another what was, what was the one that was like almost fat or something. <laughs> <laughs> but then in that because I talked about how I laugh at it. Like yeah. I laugh at it but then I find the things I laugh at with different types of people, they can be like, oh, you know how you're laughing at that yeah. and you think it's funny. Like that's actually... Like you're actually really sad about that. Oh, yeah, that could be. Yeah, but in that thing, don't I mention that it's like I put it back on me about how I'm trying to lose weight on mm-hmm. the trip. So I'm not yeah. like in some skinny guy like hanging, yeah. like tripping well, up the fat But people. that's my whole sh- – that's what Tommy and I talk about. It's like I feel like yeah. I can talk about it because I've been fat and still mm-hmm. feel that I am. But then I guess there is that sort of uh, the other angle which is sort of around – culture and us talking about it mm-hmm. that then perpetuates the the issue potentially oh, no, i think uh, it i think it's too am good. I overthinking you, about no, it no 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 you're not overthinking it but you're uh if that's the worst thing about you, you know if you feel mm-hmm. like you're a bad person like it's it's not your fault that other mm-hmm. people are feeling that mm-hmm. no, it's probably better you're talking about food and eating and about Formerly being a hundred and what was it? 140. 40, 40 <laughs> yeah. kilograms. I mean, on the other side of all these things, it could be helping somebody in some mm-hmm. way. Yes, someone who talks negatively, or laughs about how they were fat, and how, mm-hmm. you know, it, that could actually help them. It's like, hey, there's a lighter side to this. Mm-hmm. What yeah. about empathy? Where does empathy fit with what you do? Well, no one ever. I, no matter how I write things, people don't really find that I'm writing them really empathetically about people. But I, I don't. I, I try to, I try to, but people don't read it that way, which must mean that I'm failing at making. Like everyone always thinks I'm just like getting the most uh, scalding kind of uh, eviscerations of people and stuff like that. When really I'm thinking, oh no, I just did a little bit of a funny little quip or whatever like that. Uh, I was watching ABC's Love on the Spectrum, and so, which is all about uh, people with autism going on dates. Oh and since w- watching that. I can only look at every the world through people and where they are on the spectrum because I think that I, potentially I've got like a very slight bit. Oh, yeah. That idea of being a bit disconnected between uh, what you think you're doing and what you actually are doing. I know, I know. How many I people know. talk about or how many times it come up in your life around autism or the spectrum and things like that. Oh, are you like in a long, windy way? <laughs> Asking well, if you're I'm autistic. On the spect- yeah. No, only once except <laughs> on this everyone podcast, else went. <gasps> and so I realised everyone else had been thinking it. Mm. My yeah. business manager teacher asked if I had um, Asperger's. Oh, yeah. I don't know the difference between Asperger's and autism. Or I think that's a, the, it's a, it's a flavour. And so yes. what did that, how did that even come about? I was just at work and when I was at Triple J, and not on air or anything, and then I think someone mentioned it. And they said, oh, John, do you think you're a bit on the spectrum? And that was, that was the only time it's ever come up. But I, mm-hmm. but ever since that came up, I've been thinking, yeah, people must think that. And also so I, I occasionally would listen back to, like, the Triple J podcasts and I would I would say, oh, my God, like I sound like a, a crazy person or something. So is it a mood? Can you be on the spectrum on a Tuesday, be a, but I – but be okay on a Wednesday, like no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. It's always there. It's always there. I think no. that's interesting. Do you have from a? I, I'm enjoying. The, I, I'm enjoying what this format specifically. <clears throat> yes, of the. It's I very enjoy meta. Your, we're talk, we're getting meta on the question that we're yeah, asking. Yeah, yeah. Yes, which I think the do podcast you like, plays do you like into meta. It? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> do you like wine? <laughs> yeah, do you sure. like wine? Do you drink? Uh, my dad actually said something to me on the phone yesterday where I was going. My God, does my dad think I'm a drunk? <laughs> he, he brought up something he saw in some. Uh, uh, he goes, "Oh yeah, I just uh, I, I heard I read that, uh, you know, if you have one and a half glasses of red wine a night, that's okay, but not more." And I'm like, "What's this coming from?" <laughs> so I, I think he thinks I'm a, a drunk, but I don't know why. Where would he that think come that. from? Well, he I blame him for starting this narrative because <laughs> he he had the, all this wine stored. Uh, in in his garage from somewhere or whatever, and he and he said, "Oh, do, you know, do you want some of this or what?" And I was like, hey, "Okay, f- whatever." So I took some of it, and then was somehow, it really like whatever, or were you sort of a bit excited? <laughs> no, I, if I was drinking wine, I'd prefer my dad not to know. So mm-hmm. I would I'd prefer to hand over the cash 
at a, a bottle of yeah, sure. and get, get the wine without my dad being involved yeah, sure. in this shameful habit at all. So, I so it is a shameful habit. Well, it could be if you were at How many <laughs> glasses of wine are you having a night? Uh, why are you on my dad's side? <laughs> anyway, but he, so he's, so through this, he started this narrative of like I'm into wine, and I only said I, yes. Wine, but, I love wine. Yeah, I've got nothing against wine, but I'm not like a drunk. And then how the hell has my father now twisted this? <laughs> that like Are you having more than one and a half glasses yes. a night? Am I? No. Yeah. Okay. No. Would you I, like? Because I was wondering like last night I was really building up the idea of I'd love like I only started drinking this year. I'm 29. Yeah. Just started drinking this year. Um. And red wine is my go-to because it seems like there's something yeah. nice. And I said this, this to Tommy. I'm like, oh, you can't really be a drunk on red wine. And he pointed out there are many drunks. <laughs> oh who no, it's true. Prefer red wine. Do you know I'm not a drunk? I tell you why. I can tell you this <laughs> okay. is because I was talking to this dude, like a science dude. I don't know if he's actually a scientist or whatever. And he was part of a. <laughs> he's part of a. What do you what do we call a thing? With it? It's not testing, investigation. What did scientists oh, do? A, Experiment? Yeah. I don't know Hypothesis? what the hell. Hypothesis? No. I don't know what the hell it is. Anyway, because I put out on social media that I'm working on this book on smoking and cigarettes and vaping or whatever. So A trial? Yeah, was yeah, it, yeah a trial, trial or something. Clinical so, testing. Yeah, clinical testing. So yeah. people have got back to me. And th this one guy, he said, oh, I, I'm at the moment working on this clinical trial or we're about to go into it, uh, uh, seeing whether vaping helps people get off uh, things like addictions like uh, alcohol, too much alcohol, and drugs and things like that. So I straight, out, straight away was thinking, oh, this could be cool for my book, but, like, if I get to be one of the subjects <laughs> in the thing. So I said to him, oh, how, how much do you have to drink to, uh, to be an alcoholic enough mm -hmm. to go into this clinical trial or whatever? And he said, he goes, well, how much do you drink or whatever? And I said, and I was sort of, I, I looked at the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. I said, I've had, f like, a friend over and we'll go through the whole bottle of red wine and maybe, and oh, and also I've taken, I've had friend over when, and we have gin and we'll go through like three quarters of the bottle of gin. That's a lot. Like the bottle of red wine, maybe not three quarters of the bottle of gin. And he said, no. Nah. He said that you have to, it can't just be every so often. He says every day you have to be having three bottles of red wine <laughs> oh, to be an alcoholic. So that's, that's what, the benchmark. Oh, wow. yeah. So if I did two yeah. bottles of wine a night, I'm, I'm all G. It is good. Have you looked up? Um, so my concern with you and red wine mm. is, the is the calories. So <laughs> oh, no. the, the, um, I was wondering because I think that gin and vodka, uh -huh. it, it, like if because I support alcoholism, yeah. but I'm thinking like gin and vodka might be. Can it be as because I, I guess part of the red wine is I'm sort of building this poser status of oh, I yeah. got books. I got do, red do you wine. stand in front of your books? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just no. Oh, yeah. Um yeah, but what is, like if I was trying to be a poser <laughs> and I wanted to sort of have sort of an intellectual oh, yeah, okay. alcohol well, yeah, the fine, with right. low-cal, like low-calorie, yeah, yeah, vodka just seems like uh, a little um, bit. It's whiskey. It's whiskey on the yeah. rocks. Like if you Dr. To, Jason Fox, our mate, he, he, he does whiskey tasting and stuff. If you're drinking gin and water or gin and soda water or vodka, you're just wanting a vodka hit lime of and alcohol. Like you're soda. just wanting to feel different at that point. Mm -hmm. Really? I'm taking a... A bottle of gin with me on the eight day. Uh, You've already worked that out. Yeah, no. Oh my god. What do you? <laughs> <laughs> what do you take? What, what, you're allowed what, to take. You're allowed to take alcohol. What? what, what so I really you... wish I said the word alcohol. He's <laughs> 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 drunk. So, that that thinking, working that out, because that's definitely something I would do. Yeah. Which is work out in advance. Yeah. At what I mean, point what do you pull saying? it out? Do you pull it out? It's like I'm vibing the people here and it's like party. Who told you that? Who said you can bring it? You're only going to Tassie. Yeah, but they, 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 they've got like a YouTube video of like packing your bag and it's it, they tell you all the things you need to bring. And they like say thermal. alcohol. Yeah, they're saying you can. It's like the, it's like thermal underwear, socks, da-da-da, bring a book and then, yeah, you can bring alcohol if you want. But but you have to pour it into a plastic uh you have to decant it oh, yeah, uh, yeah. into a plastic uh, container, okay. which kind of takes the romance <laughs> yeah, a bit yeah, yeah. out of. Well, because <laughs> I feel like you need like a yeah, glass and like a a big circular, like ball ice thing. Yeah, they, they, I think they want you to bring a box mm -hmm. of goon. <laughs> <laughs> On the red wine thing, very quickly. Yeah. How long after you open a bottle do you need to finish it? Do you think? Oh yeah, that is. 
that is tough. Do you, do you know if you – If you, you finish live, it in one night, you don't have to <laughs> Yeah, but this is the problem. This is the problem. Like, Because mm. if you live alone and you've got the one bottle of red wine, you're not mm. going to drink it straight away. Mm. But then it's going to go off or whatever or whatever the So how long does that – like? But then you can get like half bottles, but then it's like you might as well give up. <laughs> like if you think, if you think <laughs> ordering Uber to your door is like, oh, my God. Uh, you get It's like as soon as you're going, oh, I live alone and I'll get a little half bottle. Yeah. It's like that's <laughs> too, too, I think yeah, 24 hours. You could have it at night and then yeah. the next night you can finish, finish it off. Have you got the bottle from last night? Is that what you're saying? No, well, we didn't end up doing it and so – because I, I spoke to Brie, my girlfriend, I was saying, like, uh, I think that she works out when I'm, like, really hell-bent. I've worked out that as long as I'm not hell-bent on having a wine, she wants to have one. But as soon as I'm really interested, like, yeah, let's have a bottle. She's yeah. like, oh, maybe not tonight. What's like, her nickname, Miss 97? Oh, Mr. 97. That's him. Oh, so that's, oh, that's, oh, that's your name. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the producer. He got a 97 ATAR. He's the smartest uh, in the room. And, so, and Tommy didn't finish high school and I got, like, a 40-something. I don't so, know what ATAR is. Interscore. Oh, um, yeah. You know what Interscore, Interscore is? Not really. I, I, I was like VCE. Uh, yeah, yeah, VCE. Yeah. It's his VCE. So it's score. Score. He got 97. What did you get? I, I didn't get a number out of 100. I got something like 300 and something. Oh, that's got, right. It was, you yeah. went to some international school or some shit? No, nah, yeah. just different. Steiner it was, school? <laughs> no, it's just <laughs> different. Steiner then. vibe. <laughs> I got a, yeah, thank God I didn't go to a Steiner school. Imagine. Why? The, Too creative. Yeah, it would have been. I, I didn't need that. I should have gone to a stricter school. You know what I mean? Mm. To balance things out. There you go. Oh, you've done all right. You've done John right, Safran, John. thanks for coming on the show. No, thank you. Uh, the um, John Safran versus Occult. Is that, is that how you say Occult? What, what is it called? It's called John Safran versus the, the Occult. The Occult. The Occult. It? Is that how you pronounce it? Occult. O O C U L T. O C C U L T. Mm. Yeah, that's not an audible. I yeah. think I think I understand it's it's like free. Well, this is the Here thing. We go. Well, Here we go. I I signed up for Audible back in like two thousand and nine, and I was on a US account, and so I've stayed on the US account, and so I paid for. I don't know if it's because mm. I'm outside. You of can Australia. get a free trial through Audible Australia, I and you can it. access John's mm-hmm. for free. It's just if you like it after thirty days, mm-hmm. you can. Pay no, for the uh, what I understand, the thing we want to end this on being like Real really admin. boring and admin. <laughs> no, we like this. Is that I understand you only need to have a Audible Amazon account. Amazon account because Amazon owns Audible. Mm-hmm. So you know how everyone has an Amazon account and yeah. that's like free. That's all you need. Like you don't even need to sign up for any trial or nothing. Oh, good. That's what I've heard. I've seen the free trial thing, but that sounds better. I mean, mm-hmm. I just use Josh's Audible account. Yeah. So. Do you know what? How about this? This is pretty embarrassing. When you're looking at my account, Actually, fuck, I feel like Audible could listen to this because you're on it. And then they go, no, but I, on my information, on the uh, section around, uh, is it in settings? This is great. This is great content. Josh's 40th Audible for iPhone. <laughs> I've given it to a few friends I, and it's reached 40 people. <laughs> so <laughs> how many do you actually think you've given it to? Well, I think I need to just change my password. Because well, I've probably ch- given it to maybe <laughs> 10 people. Can we please do it, change it, and see who comes out of the woodworks yeah, to get exactly. it back? Hey, mate. If you're an absolute tight ass if you yeah. come out and say, oh, Josh, it's um, it's the guy you haven't spoken to in a while. Do you listen to audiobooks? Uh, yeah, I have. The, the main ones I remember is occasionally I, I had to go on this review show. I didn't have to. I went on this <laughs> review show on the ABC, like Tuesday Night Book Club. So we had to read several books for that. And I remember, like, listening to the audio book just to speed it along. Mm. Uh, John, is there anything that the people that listen to this show could help you with for your new book? Oh, thank you so much for asking that, I guess. Well, it, it's about <laughs> the future of smoking. And so it's generally about how uh, big companies are, like, leaning into the world of, like, vaping and medical marijuana and everything like that to try to uh... – anyway, the long and the short of it is, like, if you work at a, at a cigarette company – That'd be really handy. Oh, what are people doing at cigarette companies? What sort of roles? Marketing, I guess. Actually, yeah, I mean, comms, some uh, re- some kind of relations. Have you found any interesting <laughs> ways that they're communicating? If you can't advertise, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the, yeah. that's the book. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> John. Um, I I appreciate what you do and the stuff you put out into the world. Mm-hmm. I thanks for um, training me. No worries, mate. I've somehow reeled you into all the different things. 
post training. I got mm. you to do a video with me once. It went nowhere. Really? Like a testimonial? No, it was a video <laughs> we boxing. And so it was like combination between fitness and then like presenting or some kind of content. You remember that? Best that you don't. <laughs> but now I've roped you into this and um, I appreciate you giving us your time, mate. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah, a very seven people well, well done on your weight loss. Thank you. And I feel more comfortable now talking about fat and just yes. leaning into the word and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a daily talk show. Hi at the dailytalkshow.com is the email address. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. See you tomorrow. See you guys.